Good evening. I'm glad you made it downtown. We begin tonight with a harrowing tale that would keep you on the edge of your seat. It is the exclusive story of an undercover agent who gave up his identity and everything he loved to infiltrate what authorities say is one of the most violent motorcycle gangs in America. For two years, he lived a gut-wrenching double life, riding with men he believed would murder him if they found out who he really was. He became one of them. He had to. But what would he be like when it was time to go home? So when we come back, John Miller with an agent's tale of a dangerous world no outsider has ever seen. I met the man who called himself Billy St. John in a fancy hotel bar out in California. It was the night he'd come off his longest undercover operation. I remember he looked strangely out of place there with his long hair and his leather jacket. I also remember he had that look. I'd seen it in the faces of other agents who'd gone deep undercover. He looked tired and like he couldn't believe it was finally over. There he was in LA, a town full of actors a guy who had just played the role of his life and lived to tell about it. For Billy St. John, it had been some ride. It was an amazing sight. It looked like they're going towards the 805 or the 15. Even the federal agents taking these surveillance pictures were surprised. Oh, wow. Jesus, look at this. This is awesome. The ATF agents were tracking what they say is one of the most violent motorcycle gangs in the country, the Mongols. They were also keeping track of someone else. There's our guy right there, right? In the back. Our guy, as they refer to him, is not just another biker. He is ATF Special Agent Bill Queen, working undercover inside the Mongols to gather evidence of alleged drug dealing, extortion, and murder. This case would become the longest and most dangerous operation inside an outlaw motorcycle gang in the history of ATF. There is. Yeah. yeah. Known to the Mongols as Billy St. John, Agent Queen would spend more than two years living a double life. He had to change the way he looked, the way he dressed. He had to be convincing. But this is what Special Agent Queen will look like on the witness stand when he talks about the violent life of a Mongol. They are unlike any other motorcycle club that I have ever seen. They say, respect few, fear none. I mean, they lived by that. They respected few to include the police, and they feared none to include the police. From a secret location, Queen agreed to talk exclusively to 2020 about his dangerous double life, an incredible journey that kept him on edge for more than two years a journey that is still far from over. If I had this whole thing to do over again, I wouldn't do it. ATF, or the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, is the federal agency with jurisdiction over crimes involving guns and bombs. Two key weapons, the ATF says, in a 17-year war between the Mongols and the Hells Angels for control of turf in California. What are these motorcycle gangs about? Is it about the lifestyle? Are they for profit? They're not for profit. They don't have a common goal. They, it's a camaraderie thing. It's a machismo thing. Uh, it's being top of the heap, king of the mountain for them. Billy Queen is a cop through and through, a second generation ATF agent whose father chased moonshiners through the South. If they discover a cop among them, what are they supposed to do? Have him on tape saying he'll have to die. There's a cop there, he'll have to die. There's too many people, got too much to lose. And that would have been you. That would have been me. No undercover agent had ever successfully penetrated the Mongols. Just to be considered for membership, Billy St. John had to fill out a detailed application, a complete biography that the Mongols turned over to a private investigator. We weren't completely prepared for that. Like they wanted school records and uh, phone numbers to get in touch with relatives. And we were setting up phones in different states. And, and setting up people to play the part of right. fictitious relatives. Right. And so began Queen's double life. When you were undercover, what did they think you did? 
for a living? They thought that I bought and sold avionics equipment. An undercover apartment was set up for Billy, wired for videotape and sound, so weekly Mongols meetings could be taped. And while ATF agents always tried to cover their agent with backups, there were many places that Queen's backup team just couldn't follow. Like the time Billy says, the Mongols drove him down a desolate dirt road to an orange grove for his first target practice with the gang. So you're on your own. So I'm on my own. The Mongols got out, started loading up firearms. After they loaded them up, they kind of semi-circled me, and they're all looking at me, and National Sergeant at Arms comes up to me, and he just says abruptly, okay, Billy, how long was your academy? And uh, I looked at him and shook it off. What are you talking about? How long was the academy? And uh, I kept shaking him off, and he kept getting louder. Tell us how long the f academy was, Billy. Police academy. Police academy. What's going through your mind now? You're thinking, did they make the tale? Do they know who I am? Yeah. So the guy looks at me and says, so if I put a bullet in the back of your head, nobody's going to know where to start looking for you. And I said, you're right. And then the guy turned, said, OK, Billy, turn around, go out there, and set up the targets. You're walking out into a field. And I thought, you know, this is all you can do. You bluffed them as far as you could bluff them. And if they've made you, they're going to kill you. But I walked out into the field, set up a few targets, and came back, and they didn't shoot. Billy Queen survived the initial vetting, but then there was the matter of street credibility. He says now that he was in, he had to stand and fight with the Mongols against other bikers. And sometimes, he says, he was literally in a fight for his life. And he swiped this knife across my jacket in the front, and he came after me with everything that he was worth, swinging this knife at me. And he backed me all the way out into the parking lot really quick. He's not trying to cut you. He's not trying, trying to, to cut, cut me. You. He's trying to run that knife through me. So at that point, I hollered for the chapter sergeant at arms to shoot him. And he would have actually been saving my life. And he hollers at him. And the guy looks at him and he stops. I got to ask you this. Your mind is working a mile a minute. You're thinking, I got to remember, I'm an ATF agent. I'm undercover. I'm telling this guy to shoot him. Were you able to sort that out in your head, like, this is okay or not okay? It doesn't make any difference whether it's okay or, or what policy says or this, that, and the other. I'm not going to let this guy kill me. As he gained acceptance by the Mongols, Billy says he began to make his case, gathering information on gang members' sales of drugs and guns, and learning the names of Mongols allegedly involved in unsolved murders, and receiving coded messages on his beeper from the gang's own alert system. You got a 66, that was like, come right away, come locked and loaded, because we're about to do something ugly. And many times, he says, he had to be ready to make tough calls. There had been times where I paced back and forth, thinking to myself, oh my God, what am I gonna do? Because they had plans to rape women. And they had plans to, to murder people. And I was prepared a few times to stop it, if I could. But we lucked out time and time again. Billy says one of the things that startled him was how the Mongols treated women and how some women let them. Some Mongol women wore labels proclaiming they were property of an individual. Others were property of the gang. If you were that female, you'd do whatever any Mongol wanted you to do. And to Billy, the gang's degrading attitudes were often the least of it. I sewed a girl up one morning after she had taken a beating from her Mongol man. And he had hit her in the face and had actually split her lip through and through, almost all the way up to her nose. The more I talked to Billy, the more I wondered. In 26 months of riding, drinking, and brawling with a feared biker gang, how far had he drifted from being Special Agent Bill Queen? How did he avoid becoming the person he was playing? Did you like any of them? Sure. I had gotten to the point after a certain period of time where I had downtime. And rather than call up ATF agents and say, let's go drink a beer or cook a hamburger, I found myself getting on a bike and riding up and hooking up with Mongols and running with them. It was getting confusing. Billy St. John had become an accepted member of the Mongols. 
But the time it took to gain that trust cost him. He had a family. It was hard to see them. And when he could sneak away to attend his kids' school events, he had to worry about how he looked. My kids didn't want to go up to anybody and say, that's my dad. I gave up in two years and two months, almost every holiday, all my weekends, the baseball games, the soccer games, I gave it all up. After 26 months, the operation was winding down. We were with Queen as he packed up at his house, and the man known to the Mongols as Billy St. John simply vanished. Two days later, at dawn, hundreds of ATF agents and L.A. County Sheriff's deputies swarmed out across Southern California, making 40 arrests. Based on the information supplied by Billy, the ATF got search warrants and say they recovered guns, drugs, and a cache of stolen motorcycles. Today, Agent Queen is living in a safe house, staying out of sight, using a new identity. And it is far from over. Some of those charged have pled guilty, and one has been acquitted. But lawyers for others who pled not guilty have already challenged Agent Queen's credibility and his account of what he did and what he saw. But until he testifies in court, Special Agent Billy Queen is laying low. You think they'll come for you? No doubt. I have no doubt. I, I think back, I just wonder who it's going to be. Agent Bill Queen has now been relocated and is doing his best to reestablish a normal life with his family. For all of us here downtown, good night.